How a Book Was Found One day, a fairly long time ago, there was a young person, somewhere between a boy and man. He foolishly set out to follow a road, not caring where it led him, as long as it carried him away from his parental home, from his family no longer tolerable to him. Like many young men, he boldly wallowed in the assumption that he, and he alone, had the dynamic will to behave in such a dramatic and utterly original manner. He firmly believed that the road would lead him to a rich and rewarding new life. He took with him a pack containing a few clothes and books, a bedroll, and a mass-produced stringed instrument, which he played badly. If this youth had been able to rise vertically into the air, defying those natural laws which most successfully kept him in his proper place, he might have seen many curious things. The manner in which rivers and rain interact, for example, or the layers of filth buffeted about by the four winds which unsuccessfully scour the works of man. He might have seen the last remaining great beasts sporting in the oceans, or terrible wounds to the planet in hidden places, deserts, tiny islands. If he could have looked upon, if he could have looked down upon the turning world, he might have particularly noticed a large number of other young men setting out upon roads, clutching a variety of nasty noise-generating devices, and all with wild, hopeful gleams in their eyes. But he was not able to rise in such a manner and so saw very little to persuade himself that he was in no way unique or important. Regrettably for our tale, something quite unusual did, in fact, happen to this youth. We may assume that it happened by accident rather than by design. Furthermore, the unusual quality of this event was greatly modified by the crude fact that he had no idea whatsoever that anything remarkable was taking place. He did nothing whatsoever to live up to or through the event, and soon forgot all about it. So, in one sense, our story confirms that he was merely a buffoon. After several days of trudging stylishly through rain, stealing fruit from gardens, and occasionally pausing beneath trees to pluck at his instrument and emit nasal gargling sounds from his mouth, this youth came upon a large dilapidated barn. It seemed an ideal place to rest for the night, though the day was only halfway done, where he might work upon a song which he had been creating during his long walk over the hills toward the unseen coast. Ducking in and out of the wet, he failed to see that a curious emblem was carved over the stone lintel. The barn had once been a chapel, or lesser house of a great abbey. But such things meant nothing to the youth, burning as he was with an inflated and spurious newness, brightness, revolution, and originality. The emblem which he did not see remained, nevertheless true to its own existence. It would have been in that place if he had not passed that way, even if he had not been born. This fact makes his presence in the barn or chapel even more lamentable. The carving over the door was one of two elegant tall vessels or pots, each with a serpent or dragon coiled around it, and the serpent's tails were interlinked. Flinging himself ungracefully into a sprawling posture upon the rotten straw, this youth stared for a while at the roof and at the holes in the roof humming tunelessly to himself. Then, despite the obvious fact that there was no one present other than himself, he took his instrument out of its delightful plastic bag and set himself in a very creative and meaningful pose. In this considered stance, with one leg raised with foot upon a stone, head flung back and shoulders hunched, he drew a shallow breath in through his mouth and began to strum. As he plucked and thrashed the strings, his slightly bulging eyes urged open to their full width, and a wild stammering sound spurted from his loose lips. This was not, as you might think, his new song after all, but a natural response to something which he had suddenly seen in the distant corner of the barn. Within the dusty shadows cast by late afternoon light, 
seeping through the old tiles, a pile of straw and rags was moving, heaving up into a sinister shape, sprouting two arms like extrusions, staggering and swaying towards him. I say, old boy, came a highly cultured voice, do stop that damned funny noise, will you? From out of the rags a dark brown shining bald head emerged, revealing the monster to be an elderly man wrapped in a greatcoat, with newspaper and straw stuffed in the arms and neck. He wore thick, faded green tweed trousers, heavy, well-polished army boots. In short, he was a tramp, or so it seemed at the time. Do you mind? I was trying to sleep. The youth put down his instrument, muttering something concerning the relationship between creativity and oppression. He sat and looked for a moment at the tramp, who sat and looked at him. A strong, ripe odor wafted gently but inexorably between them, as if the older man had rolled in dung, sweat, grass, cheese, earth, leather, stale bread, fried onions, and beeswax. Well, no time left to sleep now, I suppose. Must be on my way before the thunder. He paused and looked meaningfully at the youth, as if waiting for a question. What thunder, you may well ask? Well, young man, I have been caught out in the thunder before, and man must be outdoors, out from cover, rather than in a stone chapel with a timber roof. The youth muttered something about no thunder, pouting and surly. Ah, well, not that you can see it yet, nor hear it yet, of course, but it is coming, believe you me, it is coming. Thunder! The tramp sat and waited for a moment, watching his creative young guest drag stale bread and cheese from his damp pack. Would you be willing to spare a crumb of that food, perhaps? The youth grudgingly passed some bread over, which was enfolded and squeezed in a large, black, grimy hand before being eaten. How could the voice of an army officer and gentleman issue from such a seedy wreck? Yes, thunder, on its way, soon. Can't stay indoors, you know. Thunder. Rather like gunfire. What? At the word gunfire, his grammy hand shook, and the faded bright blue eyes closed for a few seconds. But you look like a clever young man. Probably had some education. Now, what would you say to the fact that, not a mile from here, I found something of immense, no, not immense, inestimable value? And what would you say if I told you that something was still buried beneath a slab of stone in a graveyard? What would you say to that, eh? The youth chewed his bread and mumbled something original, witty and caustic, to the effect that there were more valuable things in life than buried treasure. The tramp smiled gently at this, and, looking through and beyond his guest, continued to talk as if to no one in particular, or perhaps to the person who the youth might one day become. Yes, on my travels I have found many strange and interesting things. People do throw out the most useful things, perfectly adequate watches, the water that eggs have been boiled in, and the best pots of bread. But this was not thrown out, definitely not, for it was hidden. He paused, and his eyes suddenly snapped back into focus, demanding a reply. But just as the youth was about to ask a question, the tramp interrupted. Do you happen to have the right time, old boy? Confused at this deliberate disruption of what was already an abnormal conversation, the youth took his plastic watch from his pocket. He muttered that it might be around four-thirty, but he did not believe in keeping track of time so the watch could be wrong. Ah, well, I do believe in keeping track of time. Yes, indeed. Good timekeeping is the key to a productive and meaningful life. As you get older, you'll realize the truth of what I say. As he spoke, the tramp struggled to push up the left sleeve of his greatcoat, shedding straw, strips of newspaper, and what seemed to be faded photographs. He finally uncovered his shirtless brown arm and an elegant gold wristwatch, above which was another watch of a different design. Neither watch showed the time to be 4.30. Then, to the youth's callow amazement, the tramp pushed up his right coat sleeve, revealing three more watches, a schoolboy's plain old-fashioned one with a thin leather strap, a diver's with a thick steel rim and many buttons and numbers, and an immensely valuable Rolex. Upon each watch he conducted a slow ritual of correction, 
affirming the necessity for good timekeeping. When he had finished, none of the watches showed 4.30. Indeed, the youth was almost sure that they did not work at all. Now, where was I? Oh, yes, in the chapel talking to a boy about thunder. Well, I stay outside when it thunders. Much the safest place to be, you know. Sometimes I sleep in the churches, but nowadays most of them are locked, which is damn strange if you ask me. It's those radical new Bolshevik clergymen getting up to monkey tricks. The house of God should be open to all comers, not padlocked like some bloody counting house. Do you know, young fellow, that in Salisbury they have a turnstile at the door of the cathedral? What would the founder of their religion make of that little device, I ask you? So when it thunders I stay outside, because the force of the storm is dissipated, spread, you see, and not contained or amplified by the vessel of the building, particularly if it is a church. You probably know that those old churches were built to collect, as it were, the energies of nature. Well, for centuries they were blasted and knocked about by lightning until some clever chap invented the lightning conductor. But those lightning conductors only reroute electricity, which is the power that you can see. They do nothing whatsoever for the power that you can't see, if you see what I mean. At last he paused, waiting for a reply. And when the youth remained sitting in stunned silence, the tramp's eyes clouded over and he seemed to lose interest, thinking that the lecture was over at last. The youth began to pluck artistically at his instrument, producing a confused thrashing sound similar to that of an egg wisp rapidly beaten up and down across a set of bed springs. The tramp reached out a long arm and wrapped the very large hand around the strings, muffling them utterly. The stink was overpowering. The youth leant back, reluctant to breathe, but even more reluctant to relinquish his source of creative fulfillment wealth, and fame. So there I was, safe in the graveyard, where the thunder and lightning could do me no harm. I sat there and watched the storm, wondering what the right time might be. You can set your watches by those storms, you know, if you happen to know what the right time is to start with. As I sat there, a large bolt of visible lightning struck a nearby sepulcher, dating I would hazard from the twelfth century or thereabouts the sepulchre, that is, not the lightning. This is why timekeeping is so important, but my watch seemed to have stopped that day. It was a particularly fine piece of work, that tomb. It had a bold carving of a knight, his hound, a hawk, a weeping woman who was probably the knight's sister, as they were all vowed to chastity in those days. The tramp paused and waited for the youth to challenge him upon the subject of chastity, as if he knew that his suggestion was nonsense and had thrown it in merely to test his listener's lack of concentration. Hmm, well, the slab collapsed as it happened, leaving a hole rather similar to one in which I spent some time. That was back before you were born, that hole, quite a few years ago, actually. The youth tried a tentative tug at his instrument, but the hand that held it was inflexible. The tramp did not seem to notice the attempt. His eyes were set upon some distant horror that left him silent for several minutes. What? You want to know what was in that hole in the graveyard? The youth had said nothing. Well, I'll tell you, but in all good time, all in good time and right order. First of all, there was a flight of steps. Steps! Someone, I said to myself as the rain poured down, has built the chamber under there and down those steps I went. They led to a little wooden door with a bear carved upon it. Damned old door, grey like stone, of English oak, centuries old. They used to smoke it or pickle it, you know, tough as steel, outlive any foreign wood you might care to name. Now I never go indoors during a storm, far too dangerous with all the thunder and the energy and all that. But the rain stopped, and the storm had passed. And, as the next storm was several days away, according to my watch, I felt reasonably safe and pushed the door in. It was rusted off its hinges, of course. The wood outlasted the metal, as it always does. In it fell, and in I went. The monologue ceased suddenly. The hand locked around the neck of the instrument slid away. To the youth's surprise, a loud, rasping snore uttered forth and the tramp rolled over slowly into the dirty straw. 
asleep. During that period of snoring, the youth packed his bag, stuffed the instrument into its case, and rolled up his sleeping kit. He was about to creep out when he realized that it was dark, for night had arrived. He heard the bedtime bellowing of cattle singing one another to sleep, the distant purring of a tractor going home. For a moment, he almost felt that he too would like to go home. In the barn, snoring was punctuated by muttered words, commands, tiny shouts that seemed to come from a vast distance away through the sleeper's open mouth. Resting his head upon the instrument, the youth tried to sleep also. The old man's ridiculous tale drifted through his head, and he wondered what all the watches were for. Just as he slipped into a dream, in which pale-faced, meaningful young ladies complimented him upon his metaphors and his nimble fingering, he was rudely awakened by the loud voice of the tramp, suddenly speaking up, as if no break had occurred in his conversation. So there I was in that chamber. It was pretty dark. About as dark as it is in here, in fact. But there was just enough light to set your watch by, though not much more. If I'd had a luminous watch, for example, there would have been too much light for it to shine, but just enough to see the hands without them shining in the dark. Do you follow my line of thought? Good. I knew you would. Now I've been in Africa, France, parts of Asia. I spent a lot of time walking around Britain, from the far north of Scotland down to Cornwall. I know quite a few unusual things, most of which I hardly ever think about. I happen to know that it is more dangerous to be inside a church during a storm than it is to be outside. Very few people know that, believe you me. So I searched around and laid my hand upon a chest, a wooden chest. Damn thing fell apart. Probably some exotic wood chosen for the color or the scent or the rarity or something similar. Seven hundred years or so can do a lot of damage to some feeble foreign wood imported to please a greedy abbot or some effeminate prince. Again the voice stopped. The youth waited, knowing that the story would never end, fearing that he would be trapped in a barn forever listening to monologues about thunder or the relative qualities of British against foreign woods. Anyway, I laid my hands upon an object, wrapped in rags of old leather old and tough. Underneath there was good oiled leather, again and again in layers, and each layer was more whole than the one before it. Finally there was a wrapping of silk, real old spider silk, such as was made before Chinese cloth was carried over the long trade route from the east. I pulled that package out of the chamber and climbed back up to the graveyard. What happened then, I hear you ask? Well, I'm an old man, so I fell asleep. The barn was dark now, and in the sudden respite of silence, the tramp produced a stump of candle from his deep pockets, and setting it upon a block of stone between himself and the youth, struck a match. The yellowish light flickered back and forth, casting distorted shadows as the night wind breathed through many holes in the roof. Then the candle was lit and over it the tramp placed a broken glass jar to form a little lamp. By this lamplight the youth saw for the first time arched windows, long infilled with rubble stone. He saw remnants of carven faces high up towards the crude timber roof frame, and moldings and checkered patterns running high around the walls. It was as if daylight, ample enough for seeing all things, had not been as penetrating as this limited central light around which stories were told. With this half-formed realization, the youth waited patiently for the first time in his short life. Next morning, about 5 a.m., 7.33 a.m., or 10.19 a.m., I awoke to find myself still clutching the package. In the sunlight I unwrapped the plain gray silk covers to find a large handwritten book, bound in a faded cover of tooled hide. Now, if you had found it, lad, could you have read it? What I'm saying is this. It was in medieval Latin script, that horrid church Latin, some beautiful, illumin some beautiful illuminations or illustrations showing the strangest scenes. 
but all written in that horrid crab script with the N's and U's left open-ended so you could not tell the difference between them. Well, I was never much of a scholar, but I had Latin beaten into me at school, like everyone else, and I did spend some time studying between balls and parties and social events at Oxford, so I could see straight away that this was some old monkish gospel, probably a late copy, perhaps even older than it looked might have been hidden at the time of destruction and dissolution of the great monasteries. The tomb seemed even older than the book, but then I'm no expert nor archaeologist, so I just opened the covers to find what it was all about. There was the title, as bold and vivid as the nose on your face, The Gospel of Mary Magdalene. At this the youth stretched up from his customary slump position for even he knew that there was no such gospel named after Mary Magdalene. He realized at last that this was a crazy old man's fantasy. But the tramp, not waiting for an incredulous response, began speaking again. Now I know what you're thinking, that I'm a silly old chap who makes things up, just because in your King James Bible at school there never was any such gospel. Have you never heard of the Apocryphal books? Do you know that there were many great gospels suppressed or destroyed during the political growth of the church? Ha! You know so little. You don't even know about thunder and lightning. Outside. Outside is safest when the power strikes down to earth. Outside. So this gospel of Mary Magdalene, a marginal note told me that it had been copied from an ancient scroll once in the possession of St. Blighted who, in case you don't know, was the original Celtic saint who founded the local abbey. As the sun rose, by about midday, I had examined many of the pages and read a few parts of the text. There were lots of references to a boy and girl who owned two vessels or pots, though sometimes it seems as if the children were the pots. Little wonder it died out as a serious religious book. Mary Magdalene was a loose woman, you know, a harlot, Take my advice, lad, and steer clear of such women, for they will break you down. With this curious statement, the tramp paused and stared off into the deep shadows. For a moment he seemed to laugh at what he saw, but instead he immediately began to speak again. As I was saying, there were text and illustrations together. Those pictures were very elaborate with letters, animals, fantastic beasts and birds that seemed to leap right off the page at you, colored red with powdered stone and blue with lapis, and gold with fine bright gold leaf. I spent more time looking at the pictures than I did with the Latin script, I can tell you. There was one full page of a tree, growing upside down, with many strange creatures living in its branches. First of all, I thought that the vellum had been bound wrongly into the book, but when I turned it around, the animals were upside down, and so were the letters dotted around the branches like fruit. An upside-down tree with its ochre roots in a blue and silver shining sky, and its green leaves touching the red rich earth, balancing at last upon one slender central shoot. Another page showed what seemed to be a woman crucified, or perhaps it was a beautiful youth with long hair. But he or she was somehow free of the cross, no nails or ropes, and seemed to come forward towards me out of the picture with a smile such as I had not seen since since a long time passed. For a moment he paused, as if in memory, and then continued. Everything in that book reminded me of something else, and had more than one meaning. There were the capital letters that opened each page. The letter O became a cave seen from the inside looking outwards, out into the light. On this page I could make out some of the script, which seemed to say, Seek out the resurrected body, reborn forever. Then there was the letter A, which the scribe had shaped into the vault of a great cathedral. You looked down upon the long aisle, and it was all colored with gold and green leaves, just as the churches were in the old days, gilded and painted to look like a spring or summer forest, with faces and beasts peeping out of the foliage painted, and carved about the pillar and on the walls. But in the center, where the crossing would be, where they would have had a central altar, was something quite different. In the heart of that tiny letter and picture was a great double dragon, coiled around a jewel, filling the center of the cathedral and reaching up into the unseen tower above. On this page I read, 
The Anointed One passes to and fro between the throne and the void. Rejoice ye all that he is at the center of all things. Then there was the capital I, like a great carven pillar with a fruitful vine curling up it, and the words, He smote upon the pillar of the temple, crying, Cursed be they who seed the mother earth with burning stars to make her weep. Her pain shall return to them a thousandfold through many generations in the times and worlds to come. Each vowel had its own tiny detailed picture as a capital letter. U was a cup or chalice, or perhaps the Holy Grail. E had angels climbing up and down its branches as if it were a ladder. I turned to the very end of the book to read the final words. There was something about a band of travellers setting off westward. Then a different clear hand had added a march. Then a different clear hand had added a marginal note, and some say that the two vessels dispersed their bounty throughout these blessed islands, so to this day do we bear their symbols as our arms, knowing likewise that two vessels and two dragons live within each man and woman. Then another scribe had added the last words, squeezed into the bottom right-hand corner of the page. Guard you the innocents from all who shun charity, from all those who close doors, from all those who live without joy or grace. Such are the words of Mary of Magdala, who speaks of a great love to those living at the closing of the second age. Such is also our word for the protection of this, her gospel, even unto the fifth age, after which a new revelation shall arise in the hearts of men and women. Well, it was all beyond me, being a simple, straightforward, no-nonsense sort of chap, much like yourself. The tramp paused to observe the youth's response to this bizarre comparison, but as his listener was about to speak, he continued, So I thought I'd better take the book to the local vicar. After all, it was in his grave, if you see what I mean, and those old abbey ruins were his patch, on his patrol. I wrapped it all back up in the old silk and leather and walked over to the vicarage, which is about three miles from where we sit now, providing you are not distracted or sidetracked in any way. Yes, I've traveled widely. Yes, I have traveled widely in my time, and good manners mean a lot to me. I would say that, next to accurate timekeeping, it is good manners that make the British people civilized. I cannot stand an ill-mannered person least of all an ill-mannered woman. The tramp fell silent, and after some minutes had passed, the youth assumed that the old man slept again. His bulky square shoulders and round shining head seemed immobile in the faint lamplight. A rat squealed and scurried in the straw. There were night noises as the roof beams settled and moved to their own secret pattern. But the youth was now fascinated by the story, and opened his mouth to speak hoping to awake the teller. He had hardly drawn breath when the tramp spoke up briskly, as if he had never paused. So what about good manners, I hear you ask? And you are right, my boy, to ask such a question. I admire your perception. Well, in my younger days, and if it had been a man, I might have thrashed him. But this was a woman, and bad manners in women have always puzzled me. So I knocked upon the vicarage door, and out came the vicar's wife. "'Good day, ma'am,' I said, and she gave me that suspicious look that means, "'No cup of tea here.' "'Good day, ma'am, and might the vicar be at home?' "'No. Yes,' she says. "'Damned if I see how he can be out and in at the same time.' So I hold up the book, and she sort of flinches back. "'I have found this book, ma'am, in the nearby parish graves.' I wish to place it in your husband's safe-keeping. I take a step forward, and she slams the door in my face. Slam! In my face! I look at the time. It is 3.33 p.m., or 5.42 p.m., or 7.29 p.m., and I think that the vicar was a tomfool to marry such an ill-mannered hussy. Right, I says to the book. Back you go. So I walk back to the graveyard, but by a different road. Took three or four days, I think, and there was some thunder about. When I got back there, I stuffed the gospel of Mary Magdalene into that little chamber where it had hidden for all these centuries, and pushed the door shut hard. Last forever, that pickled English oak. Nothing like it in the world. 
Then, just to spite her, the Viker's wife, that is, I spent a day or so pushing earth back into the hole with my bare hands. No one uses that graveyard now. They have a new place over by the housing estate, and no one saw me work. No one ever sees me at work. Not long after that it was time to head north, about 8.24 a.m., on a Monday, with the weather dry and no sign of thunder. Never saw that book again. Might still be there, for all I know. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And with these words the old tramp rolled over and slept. This time he did not snore, but twitched and muttered his way through bad dreams. The youth extinguished the lamp and crept away into the early dawn. A few stars were shining, and the road glowed with that pearly light that comes before the rising sun. He walked away, glad now to have made his escape. By sunrise he had caught a lift right through to the city, forgetting all about the sea that he had originally aimed for. He never thought about the chapel, the old man, or the hidden book again.